that has just so heavily impacted the children. And uh, Father, we commit Davy and Millie and Tommy and Victoria and all the children, all the wider family, to you at this time. Oh soul, are you troubled, are you weary? Are you finding life such an uphill struggle? Are there things pressing in that are so difficult to bear? Father, we commit one another to you this morning. We commit Davy and the family to you. We commit others who are here today who perhaps bear secret troubles, secret difficulties that are so hard to bear. Perhaps as the only Christian in a household. Perhaps with illnesses that have no easy or short-term solution. We think of them also. Father, we encourage each other, we encourage our friends on Zoom, we encourage our own hearts here in the building to fix our eyes, to turn our eyes, to turn our eyes away from the things that are of only temporary value, that are passing, but to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the source of hope and love and healing and power. Oh, Lord Jesus, we look to you this morning. And in looking to you, we open our hearts and we connect with you. We reach out to you by faith. And we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that our confidence in Christ is absolutely well-placed. There is no better place to stand today but with eyes fixed on Jesus. So we thank you for this, O God, and just pray for Jim as he comes now to speak to us and pray that, Lord, you would just bless our brother and pour your spirit out upon him that we might hear the voice of God this morning and the word of God to us would bring life and hope and would conform us to your will and your purposes. In the midst of all else that's going on, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. And uh, this morning we're turning again to First Peter, and uh, this week, chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. And I'll just read that through. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful uh, a faithful creator while doing good. Amen. One of my uh, heroes is uh, Sir Edmund Shackleton, and uh, he, uh, of course, went to the uh, Antarctic area. He went on a journey with Captain Scott, but he was sent home early because of ill health. And uh, then he set out in a, another imbi- uh, expedition to go and cross the Antarctic region. And uh, he put an advert into the, the newspaper saying, Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months in complete darkness, constant danger, uh, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And you might have thought that that uh, advert might not have attracted any candidates, but in fact, quite a lot of people uh, applied for that particular expedition. And uh, it's a great story, uh, the story of endurance. I would really encourage you to watch the film of how they they crossed over from the Weddell Sea into uh, South Georgia and they were rescued and so on. A great story. 
But, um, you know, the Lord Jesus, when he was uh, saying about becoming a Christian, did not make the advert particularly attractive. Uh, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. And that is the price of becoming a Christian. And, uh, you know, there's no sugar coating, there's no pretense. It's very clear, take up the cross and follow me. When we come to uh, First Peter, we have the subject of suffering. And uh, 17 times over, as Gordon was indicating earlier, in First Peter, we have this uh, subject address of, uh, of suffering. On the 19th of uh, July, 64 AD, not 1964, but 64 AD, um, uh, we have the famous story of Rome burning while Nero fiddled. Uh, you might be familiar with that phrase, but basically uh, Nero was the emperor and uh, he had a great estate in Rome, but what he didn't like was the fact that there were so many slum uh, dwellings in the city of Rome, and so he deliberately set fire uh, to buildings and sat and fiddled while Rome burned. He did not permit uh, fires to be put out. The fire went further than anticipated, and in fact, um, the temple of Jupiter and some of the gods in the city of Rome were burnt to the ground. He became very unpopular, and there was an uprising against him. And uh, the uh, historian Tacitus um, wrote this, and uh, this is a direct quote from him. But all human, uh, he basically encouraged people to try and appease these gods. Uh, he said that, that you know, the fire had come, um, and they should have try and appease and propitiate the gods. But... Tacitus says, but all human efforts and all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration was a result of an order. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, that's Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Accordingly, an arrest was made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus. Now, Tacitus was not a Christian. He was just a historian who wrote that account. But um, Peter's letter was written in AD 64, and uh, I think it was written probably against that background of the persecution that came upon the city of Rome. And the Christians generally suffered persecution for a period of about 200 years. Now, we live in uh, very uh, safe circumstances in the West, and uh, some people do suffer as Christians. In fact, probably most of us suffer as Christians. It might be that uh, we rejected socially. It might be that we don't make the same advance in our career as normal, etc., and we know a bit of persecution. But there are Christians, one in eight, this was uh, just lifted from the Open Doors website, um, there are one in eight Christians in the world uh, suffer severe persecution. Uh, countries uh, are listed up there and uh, include Sudan and Pakistan and um, severe persecution all over the world. Now, Peter writes, and he says in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes, when it comes, not if it comes, upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And he says, do not be surprised. This is something to be expected. And again, the Lord Jesus is very 
um, clear in his message. He warned the disciples that he was going to the cross to suffer. And Peter himself thought he would like uh, a Jesus without any suffering. And he said, no, this is not going to happen to you. Just rely on me. I'll, I'll protect you. And, and Jesus, and he said, far be it from you, Lord. This will never happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, for you don't understand what's happening. And uh, later he says to his disciples, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. I can't understand how the world, why the world hated Jesus. <laughs> he came with a message such a gracious message. He came to save people. He came to heal and forgive. And yet the world rejected Jesus. And he said, if it rejected you, then if it rejected me, then it is going to reject you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. Horatius Bonner wrote uh, an old-fashioned hymn. Some of you might remember it. Go labor on, spend and be spent. Thy joy to do the Father's will. It is the way the Master went. Should not the servant tread it still. And yet, I think it probably is a surprise to many people in the world who are Christians that there is trials and suffering and difficulties I lifted this straight from a, a mega church in America's website. Um, it says, We believe that as part of Christ's work of salvation, it is the Father's will for believers to become whole, healthy, and successful in all areas of life uh, spiritual, mental, and emotional, physical, and financial. <laughs> and uh, there is a kind of false gospel that is, is being preached and in the world today. That's not new. Uh, Jeremiah said in his day, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their dest detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. And in Jeremiah's day, there were people who were um, you know, saying there's no problem, you don't have to deal with the subject of, of sin and so on. It was almost like going to the doctor with a serious uh, disease and the doctor saying, there's no problem, go home and take a paracetamol and all will be better. And, uh, you know, I think one of the great dangers of the COVID situation is that many people are turning to, um, you know, get their, their teaching on American websites and there's a whole host of these uh, kind of preachers who are uh, preaching this message that to become a Christian is to know financial prosperity. Sow a seed, and in seven days later, you'll have tenfold a return. This is not the Christian message. Christ warned, take up your cross and follow me. When Saul of Tarsus became a Christian, um, Ananias was told to go and visit him, and uh, Ananias was afraid because he knew that Saul of Tarsus had been a persecutor of the church, and he suspected that Saul might be in Damascus to arrest him. And Jesus uh, and the Lord said to him, "Just go, because Paul is a chosen instrument to carry my name to the Gentiles, for I will show him how much he must suffer." For my name. And the Lord Jesus, in the parable of the sower, warned that the seed can fall into rocky ground and it might spring up, you know, suddenly and quickly, but it has no root because when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall quickly away. I sometimes I suspect that generally um, people <laughs> see Jesus as somebody that they feel sorry for. They, they think, well, I'll invite him into my life. Uh, I'm doing him a big favor. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take him on board. And then, 
you know, suddenly things go wrong and they um, <laughs> think to themselves, you know, here I am, I've done Jesus a favor taking him on board and here I am in trouble and, you know, they abandon uh, their, their, their belief. But suffering is inevitable not only as human beings, but many people suffer as Christians. And if we do suffer as a Christian or when we suffer as a Christian, uh, Peter's saying, but rejoice do not, uh, insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. This is counterintuitive, but uh, there's so many examples throughout the Bible of Paul and Silas in jail and so on, and uh, we are encouraged to rejoice in sharing Christ's suffering. And one of the perspectives that helps us during those times of suffering as Christians is that we, if we have a reason to be glad and rejoice when His glory is revealed. This word rejoice is a word of just joy, but uh, the word glad is be overjoyed, be you know, ecstatic, <laughs> and we will be ecstatic when Jesus' glory is revealed if we suffer as Christians. Um, I remember, and uh, this shows how good my memory is, uh, my Sunday school teacher uh, giving us this example. He said there was a, a prisoner who had a ball and chain, <laughs> and uh, he carried this ball and chain for years around, dragging him and he kept on complaining about the weight of the, the, the heavy ball that was attached to his ankle. Uh, years later, it was discovered he was innocent of the crime for which he had been accused. And the king proclaimed that this ball of, uh, uh, that he had been uh, supporting for all those years, uh, that the equal weight be given to him in gold. <laughs> And uh, it turned into, you know, the, it was weighed and he was given gold in its place and he wished <laughs> that the ball had been heavier <laughs> for all these years. You see, you know, we suffer here, but as uh, that hymn goes on to say by Horatius Bonner, go labor on, tis not for naught, thy earthly loss is heavenly gain. Men heed thee, love thee, praise thee not, the Master praises, <laughs> what are men? And uh, the Lord Jesus, you know, in His ministry in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We've got a reward coming. <laughs> we go through the pain. Athletes go through the pain barrier. They lie in ice baths. They get up at four o'clock in the morning to train. They go to the gym in order to uh, try and win that great podium position at the Olympic Games, the day of victory and glory. And there is a day coming for reward for those who suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, uh, verse 13, you share Christ's suffering, but you'll be glad when His glory is revealed. We do have this tandem uh, in the Bible, those twins that come together so often. In First Peter, we've already come across it in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 11. He talked about Christ, His sufferings, and the the glory that would follow. Next week, God willing, in chapter 5, uh, when Alan McKinnon comes, we have another verse of Christ's suffering, who will also share in the glory that shall be revealed. In Romans chapter 8, we are told, and I think uh, uh, Gordon quoted this earlier, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. See, we suffer for a little time, but there is an eternity, there is a never-ending period of glory that will be replacing the suffering down here below. 
an oyster goes through a time of pain. It takes a, a grain of sand into its uh, innards, and that uh, sand irritates, and the, the reaction is that the uh, oyster uh, secretes some uh, fluid that builds up and it eventually produces a peril. There's no peril without suffering. And he says in verse 14 here, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Not only future glory, but if you suffer for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory rests upon you. Now, the glory of God came down on the tabernacle. The glory of God came down on the temple area uh, in the Holy of Holies. And so it is for those who are Christians and those who are suffering during those times, the glory and the presence of God comes down and rests upon us and helps us through those difficult times. Now, it is possible to suffer, but not as a Christian. We could suffer because we're a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a meddler, um, and we should not go out looking for suffering. <laughs> He's not encouraging us to go out and have a kind of experience of trying to stir up hatred and, and uh, you know, attract um, the suffering experience. And uh, if we're suffering, it should be for good reason. It shouldn't be because we're a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a meddler. A meddler is somebody who just gets involved in other people's affairs. They're the sort of nosy parkers, I suppose, would be the kind of uh, equivalent phrase we would use today. Uh, Peter himself, who wrote this, remember he um, decided when Jesus was going to be arrested in the garden of Gethsemane that he would take his sword and he struck uh, one of the soldiers, Malchus. Now, I, I think he intended to go for Malchus's head, but he missed and he sliced off his ear. And Jesus very graciously picked, <laughs> bowed down, picked up the ear and he put it back onto Malchus and he said, put away your sword. And uh, we're not going to suffer here as murderers or thieves or whatever. Verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let uh, him glorify God in that name. This is only one of three places where the name Christian is mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> you might have thought that, it, you know, Christian is a, a phrase that's used a lot, but uh, this is only one of three places, and a, a Christian is not just somebody who is nice to people and sings kumbaya and so on, but a Christian is somebody who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has come in repentance and faith and uh, turned to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. That is a Christian. And he says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God in that name. It is very possible to be ashamed. And Peter is an example of that himself. Remember how when Jesus was arrested and taken to the house of Caiaphas to be put on trial, um, this little girl came up and said, are you not Peter, are you not one of these men who followed Jesus? And Peter denied, and he denied, and he denied with oaths and curses the name of Jesus. And he was ashamed to be associated with him. And that's perhaps quite an extreme example, but sometimes we are ashamed. You know, we, if you put in you know, an application for a job. <laughs> you say, what are your interests and hobbies? Do you put down, to understand me, you must understand that I am a Christian. <laughs> or, you know, you have a casual conversation, you know, where were you yesterday? And you should really be saying, well, I was at Bethesda hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We say to a colleague, well, 
it was a nice day, we went out for a walk. <laughs> and you're ashamed. And I'm ashamed. And, but remember that we ought to glorify God in every circumstance. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. It's a time for not judgment in the sense of uh, punishment, but a time of assessment. You have judges in uh, sport, etc., and you have testing. And, uh, you know, it's in that sense that God assesses us and puts us through circumstances in order that we might be purified and emerge the stronger. For it is time uh, for judgment to begin with the church of God. And uh, we must be sensitive to that. But if it is time for judgment to begin at the church of God, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? You know, I've said earlier that, you know, for the Christian, we've got all eternity to celebrate and to enjoy the glory of God. If that's the case, you know, what's the outcome going to be of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Well, in First Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writes to those Christians, people who had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We have to be honest that the message of the Bible is quite stark, that there is a gospel message that is there to save us from the wrath to come. But people who reject the gospel message know a far greater time of judgment and wrath. And I would really encourage you to flee from that prospect. As uh, sometimes we spend a lot of time in our prayer meetings as churches, you know, praying for those Christians who are in hospital and going through times of difficulty, and it's right we do so. But we Defer from praying for those who are not Christians, who are running about the streets of Helensburgh in their track suits and, <laughs> and super fitness. And the person who is a Christian and in hospital tonight, they might be, he or she might be an old person with just a few years to live. But that person who is in hospital and is a born-again Christian and uh, has all eternity to look forward to with the Lord Jesus Christ, and a person who is pounding around the streets of Helensburgh in their tracksuits and, uh, and, and with absolutely no problems, if they know not Jesus Christ, what will the outcome be if they reject the uh, uh, gospel of God? It tells us in Second Thessalonians, and this is tough language, and flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. When He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among those who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Now I feel awkward sometimes when I give that message. <laughs> but I have to be honest, this is the gospel message. This is the message of the Bible. In order for people to know that they should be saved, they have to know what they should be saved from. <laughs> and I would have had absolutely no problem if I had stood outside Grenfell Tower a couple of years ago and said to the people, get out of the building. Flee from the, the punishment that is coming, from the, the fire that is coming. And I'm saying today in 2020 here in Helensburgh, 
Come to Jesus for salvation. There's such a wonderful salvation. He says in verse 18, if the righteous is scarcely saved, if it's difficult for those who are Christians to, su to suffer here, he said, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now we think of the wrath of God, but um, if we want to see the uh, wrath of God in its fullest extent, we just need to look at the cross. R.C. Sproul says, the most violent expression of God's wrath and injustice is seen in the cross. If ever a person had a room to complain for injustice, it was Jesus. He was the only innocent man ever to be punished by God. If we stagger at the wrath of God, let us stagger at the cross. Here is where our astonishment should be focused. The Lord Jesus bore the wrath of God in order that you and I may go free. <laughs> It's the, in order to understand how good the good news is, you have to understand how bad the bad news is. And there is great news. There's the good news of salvation. Oh, flee to Jesus this morning. Do not hold back. There might be a price to pay in terms of your reputation or your family or whatever, but flee to Jesus. It's, he bore the wrath. And this shows how serious the matter is. He bore the wrath of God upon the cross. Verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust, just entrust, put your total confidence in their souls to a faithful Creator while doing good. We know a faithful creator, don't we? Amazing that for the last, I don't know, many thousand years or whatever, the world has been in perfect orbit around the sun. It always amazes me <laughs> that the world uh, is moving uh, at, and it turns at the precise angle required for summer and winter and the stars are all in place. They've been there for countless generations. They're all in place, and the sea stops at uh, Clyde Street, and, you know, God is God is uh, all creation. He's a faithful creator. He's in charge. He knows what he's doing, and Peter is writing to those Christians, encouraging them to uh, just commit everything to a faithful creator. We do suffer and uh, I've talked this morning about those who suffer as Christians just because they are Christians. We do also suffer because of other reasons, because we're human and because of ill health. We suffer bereavement and trials, and that is not what we've been particularly focusing on this morning. Um, but in the midst of those times when we suffer, uh, these bereavements and trials and ill health and worries and concerns, not necessarily as a Christian. We have the ministry of the Holy Spirit and, uh, to help us uh, in our time of need, and we really pray that uh, God will help those who are going through such difficult circumstances uh, this morning especially. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we feel it's been a, a solemn chapter to study this morning. Perhaps there are some who have difficulties with it, and we just pray that uh, your Spirit will open our eyes to hear what you're saying into our lives this morning, and we pray that um, for those who are concerned and the Spirit is working in their hearts. We pray this morning that they will flee to Jesus for salvation. We uh, give thanks that we have such a, a good news message to proclaim that Jesus Christ died upon the cross in order that we might uh, receive forgiveness for our sins, in order that we might know the hope of uh, eternal glory as we would share it with you. 
And uh, we give thanks for such a message this morning, and we pray that uh, you will help us in our time of need. We would come to the throne of grace again this morning, recognizing that we come uh, before a, a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. We give thanks that his name is not only the Son of God, but his name is Jesus. He was given that name Jesus when he was down here on earth. And he came to this earth at what we call Christmas time in order that he might go through the types of experiences that we go through, in order that he might experience suffering as we experience it, in order that he can understand. And we give, under, we give thanks that there is a Jesus in heaven who stands before the throne of God and he pleads on our behalf. He knows what it is to be tired. He knows what it is to be betrayed by those who were once called friends. He knows what it is to be bereaved. We remember he wept at a grave and he comforted sisters who were uh, standing by that grave. Oh Lord, we give thanks that uh, in all types of suffering, he would relate to us. He is here to deliver us from our suffering and help us in our time of need. And we would just turn to you and uh, have a special request for those who are going through uh, those difficult times this morning. Uh, we pray also for those who are suffering as Christians in many parts of the world. And uh, we think of uh, places like Libya and Sudan and uh, Afghanistan and China this morning and many areas of the world where our brothers and sisters are suffering uh, for just because they say they are Christians. And we commend uh, Open Doors and the Barnabas Trust and those who are trying to bring relief and help to them in this time of need. And so we uh, give thanks that we can come to you in the all-availing and powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we pray that you'll hear us in our time of need. And we pray that uh, those who have been uh, spoken to by this message this morning may call out to you in uh, faith and repentance and commit themselves to the faithful creator and guardian of our souls in this worthy name. Amen. Thank you, Jim. That was a difficult passage to bring to us this morning, but faithfully done, and the challenge remains, and the blessing remains, the hope remains, the gospel remains. Um, I've just put on the screen there just for anyone who would wish to, uh, for any reason really, and there may be lots of reasons at this time in our world, that you would appreciate just someone at the end of a phone. Maybe someone distanced from your immediate life, uh, myself, Fiona, and Ken, we are available for anyone who wishes to, to chat about anything you've heard this morning uh, or uh, to, to chat about any other matter that might be happening. If it's practical uh, advice or, or support you need, we will do anything we can to help at this time. Please do get in touch. We're going to finish on an upbeat. We are going to count every blessing. We're going to remember the reasons we have to uh, praise the Lord and to worship him in the midst of all that is happening.